Welcome to... Go ahead. <laughs> hello, hello. How is everybody doing this week? And welcome to another edition of America's number one show about customer service. And we're number one because we are the only show in town. The customer and the service. I am Commander Sean Petrowski. And as always, Captain you, John Lamazny is with I me. I am Captain John Lamazny. That's damn right. Well, I figured, you know, you're the most Picard-looking of, of the two of us. Yeah, and you're more, you're more Kirk-like Kirk and I'm more Picard-like. That's true. <laughs> so uh, we got another uh, action-packed week for everybody. And uh, we got three topics as usual. And let's not waste any time. Let's get right into it. Um, there's been a lot of uh, things going on in... Uh, the technology world right now uh, in terms of uh, Apple. We know that Apple has just released a new iOS device, the iPhone 5. Uh, and there were some changes made to the iPhone 5 compared to all the other iPhones and iPods and uh, iPads even. That was a, a, br a big change. And what's the, what is the beautiful thing about the constancy of iPods and iPads. What's what's the really great thing for vendors who create accoutrement for iPhones? Well, there's been a standard interface on the uh, on the i the uh, they started with the original, well, not the original. The original iPod was a FireWire cable, but I think it was the second gen iPod introduced this thing called the iPod connector, which then became the standard interface port. Uh, for all basically portable devices that Apple has invented now for over probably 10 years, right? And it was a 30-pin uh, serial connector, right? That's right. And so with the most recent iPhone release, uh, they had decided to change that connector. And this is a perfect example of a topic we like to call arbitrary changes made that negatively affect their customers. Right. Um, we have a couple examples that we want to talk about, but let's start with Apple because Apple's made two big ones that are affecting their customers, their diehard customers, very negatively. And I think it's really important to talk about it because uh, there's been a lot of press on this. People have been blowing up social media about these different uh, changes. And if you've been paying attention, you'll know that Apple actually has reasons behind these major changes. Uh, but someone uh, who, like myself, who follows technology news very, very, very closely daily, uh, I can tell you that I'm not buying. I'm not buying what they're selling when it comes to the changes. Uh, how about you, John? Are, are you? Are you? Have you been following this closely or not? I, I've been following it pretty closely, and as a matter of fact, I'm going to be giving a talk. I'm going to be defending Android in an Android versus iOS talk next Tuesday at Princeton Public Library uh, that I'm really excited about. And one of the things I was sort of concerned about was the argument that iOS and their devices uh, are a walled garden. Uh, that that uh, you don't have to worry about whether or not your device works with the wall of accoutrement when you walk into a mall and they have one of those uh, phone uh, add-ons stands. You know when you get one of those devices, when you get one of these accoutrement pieces, they're going to work with your iPhone because every iPhone recently has the same connector, has the same shape, has the same size. It's it does not change and that constancy is one of the things that they have been able to grow a side business on and not them grow a side business but but uh, have all these vendors create things that work with the iPhone because the iPhone doesn't change whereas the Android uh, ecosphere has from one phone to the next different dimensions different sizes different everything different screen size different uh, bezel size, different connector sometimes, sometimes it's proprietary, usually it's the micro USB, which is actually a standard. It is. And it uh, doesn't cost the 25 bucks to go get a cable. For, no. You know, yeah. So uh, that, that was an argument that um, I don't really have to worry about anymore because 
uh, all those things that people have been buying for years uh, are essentially worthless if you decide to move forward with the platform. And uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, and this is something that I think kind of uh, flies in the face of what I think Steve Jobs has stood for. And I'd be curious to really find out if he knew that this change was coming, if it's something he supported or not. Um, but, you know, this idea that, like you said, you could go into a store, you could buy an accessory, and you knew it was going to work. You didn't have to. You didn't have to worry about it. Was something that Apple strives for in all their products. You know, it's ease of use, reliability, um, and a very um, you know re reliable purchasing experience and use and use experience. And so now, let's if we look at the current offering of Apple devices, you have two generations of iPads that are available, right? Two and the new three. You have the um, the iPhone 4S, which is still available. You have uh, you don't have the iPhone 3GS available anymore, but the 4 is still available, and the 4S. Uh, and I'm not 100% sure if the iPod Touch has switched connectors yet, but let's say for the sake of this conversation, uh, it's still on the, on the old interface. So that's a whole line of devices I just listed still on the old iPod connector standard, okay? And now Apple releases their first brand-new device, iPhone 5, and it's using their new, uh, I believe they call it Thunderbolt, cable, a certain Thunderbolt dock or something to, along those lines. And everything that you've bought doesn't work anymore. And uh, does the new dock require Thunderbolt in order to connect? Or does it use the, the visual, the display port, the older style display port on older MacBook Pros? Uh, I'm not 100% sure what, what the standard is now. It, it, it is a new cable standard. I don't I don't remember what they're calling it, but it's not it's not based on any existing standard. Thunderbolt, as you know, is a tech as a standard that was developed by Intel. Right, and adopted as far as I know, really only by by Apple. At this point, right. And yeah. um, but the new iPhone connector is not um, it's not it's not built based on that Intel technology. It's a whole new uh, platform. And I understand that the standards are, are, are not even 100% public yet. I was just reading an article how people discovered that there's a, a secret microchip that is now uh, on the connector itself underneath the plastic uh, shielding of the, of the connector cable. Uh, and nobody really knows what it's for. Because um, the original information that Apple released about the new cable standard mentioned nothing of this microchip. So people are starting to really uh, question what's going on because we all know the iPhone 5 is out right now. And so yeah, I'm going to see if we can bring it up real quick just so we can not have so many question marks around it. Sure, absolutely. And while you're doing that, I think it's important to also note too that Apple has made available an adapter. Um, so if you have an old you know, uh, iPod connector accessory, their claim is that if you buy this you know, thirty-five dollar uh, adapter or fifty dollar adapter. You can use any of your old accessories with the new iPhone five, but we know that that's not going to fly because if you think about a dock, you add this adapter into the dock. Um, it's going to change how the phone sits in the dock. It's not going to be flush. There it is, right there. That's yeah, it. So lightning that's cable. The connector. That's the new connector. Looks like it's called light a lightning cable. So they're kind of playing off that Thunderbolt uh, terminology. Yeah. And um, but it's a whole new standard, and there's and so there's a secret chip in there that nobody knows what's going on. And as you can see, like it's a lot smaller than the old uh, iPod dock connector. Yeah. Here you go, right there. It was a thirty pin, and now it's even it's a nineteen pin design, which is a big difference. And, and Apple claims that the the old iPod dock uh, connector had a lot of um, Irrelevant uh, features to it, like there was still there was FireWire support there for when the first iPod was released and, uh, and used uh, FireWire exclusively, um, and then there were a bunch of other um, 
yeah, that image right there with the uh, iPod dock and the adapter right there. Perfect. That's a perfect right. photo. Um, so that's what you got to buy now. That adapter on the top if you want to try and use your old accessories with your new iPhone 5. And as I was saying before, let's say you have a dock, uh, which a lot of people do. iHomes, people use them as alarm clocks, all kinds of stuff. Sure. That's going to ruin that whole experience. There's no way that that is going to allow you to continue to use that dock. And I don't know if you're familiar with the prices of iHomes or other docks, John, but, uh, you know, for a decent one, you're talking about a minimum of at least 100 bucks. Yeah. So, you know, let's say you bought an iPhone 4S, which was about a year ago. You bought a dock for it. You're, you're dropping another uh, $100 if you have an iPhone 5. Wow. Which is which is absolutely absolutely crazy. Uh, I think that Apple, you know, with the research and development, the innovation that goes on at Apple on a nearly uh, probably daily basis, I feel as though they could have kept the existing uh, dock connector and reworked it, you know, to be more efficient uh, without having to completely abandon the interface. I mean, that's my opinion. I agree, and uh, you know. So that's why I feel like it's a it's a fairly arbitrary experience now. So you know we talked about Apple's they they love this walled garden approach. They they the ecosystem the Apple iOS ecosystem is something that they pride themselves on because it makes things easy for people. You know they don't have to worry about compatibility issues, and the laundry list goes on and on. And now this this is this is completely flying in the face of that. And you know, when this cable was announced with the new uh, with the iPhone 5 announcement event uh, that was in uh, September, um, bloggers, tech tech journalists were you know, and in people you know, even Apple supporters were um, really really disappointed and up in arms about it. And yeah, I think it seemed like some pretty bad reviews. All I was looking for was a photo of the device of the of the standard. And they were all attached to these really negative articles. Right. And so this is an example of what we call uh, an arbitrary change that affects customers negatively. Um, and there's another change that uh, Apple's made that's being introduced with iOS 6, uh, which is being ushered in with the iPhone 5 and then, you know, the previous phones. You know what that other change is, John? Are you talking about the the... The size issue? I'm talking about it's a piece of software that people used oh. to know and love that you're a big supporter of on your Android device. Podcasts? Apple, uh, Google Maps being oh, phased oh, out. Oh, of course. In favor of Apple Maps. Yes. I'm yes. sorry. That was the, the most obvious uh, thing. Uh, yes, I'm very familiar with this issue. Yeah. So... What are your What are your thoughts on it? Let's. Uh, what do you know about this about this uh, new so, change? So, um, there was a disagreement between Google and Apple about how Apple was able to use Google Maps, and Google walked away, um, only offering the ability to use Maps in a static way as opposed to using turn by turn directions, because turn by turn directions was supposed to be a differentiator for Google and was for a very long time. And there are alternatives to Google Maps, uh, such as TomTom Tom and Waze and lots of other apps that do turn by turn. Not all of them are free and offered with the OS, and um, none of them are of the reinforced, heavily supported, heavily tried, heavily invested upon level that Google Maps is. And when navigation showed up, on the first Android device, it was a major reason for people who use their phone like you or I do uh, as an everyday in your pocket device. Uh, it, it, it came up as a, well, what do I need a GPS for anymore? And what else can I do with this thing? And they've integrated it so deeply into that operating system between places and maps and latitude and it, there, there's an entire geospatial uh, ecosystem on that phone that relies on the GPS signal and integrates so well with things like navigation. I can use any of these maps, latitude, maps, 
places uh, local and jump into navigation from them and be able to go to whatever place it was that I was interested in. Plus, they've also integrated it into search itself so that if I search on my desktop for some particular place, uh, it will now show up in what's called Google Now on the latest version of Android, which is essentially Google Search. So I do a Google Search and it uh, throws up contextual clues about what I might want to do next. And very often it's, it gives me a, a hint to navigate to the place that I search for. So what's the first thing you do when you need to go somewhere, you know, and you, you've never been there before? You probably do a search for it, right? Absolutely, always. Yeah. And even if you're just using traditional directions, you would do that. But now, just by doing a search on a place or being interested enough to visit a place online that starts with a Google search, if you happen to be logged in on your Google search when you do that search, the next time you open up your Android phone, it'll say, oh, that place that you were interested enough to go and search for, would you like to navigate to that place? And it's that kind of whole system integration that makes Android, the operating system itself with Google services, a beautiful thing. Uh, and they, Google was restrictive with that in terms of differentiation because they wanted to be able to say, if you go with Android, this is one of the things that you'll get, and we think it's pretty damn great. And they were right. So Apple said, well, we need to do something else because uh, we are, we're going to lose this functionality. And they decided to go their own route. And what they have found out is that it's not so easy to make a great maps solution. Not so easy to make a great navigation solution. And unfortunately for them, they're suffering in that respect now because if an iPhone user uses navigation nearly as much as I do on my Android phone, uh, and the service is nearly as bad as many people indicate, it's unusable. And I use navigation every day on my phone. I use navigation to go to places that I know about because there are extra added benefits to that, including uh, indicating to the system that I use to sort of know where I've been, that I have been there, Right? By having GPS on, by having navigation, it, it gives me statistics about uh, how long uh, I was at home one week versus at work one week, or how long I spent at some other location, like um, how frequently I go to a certain location that I might not notice how much I go there, and what that might mean to me financially, and what that mean might mean to me from a understanding of my personality. Like, it's not just about me knowing how to get there, it's all the extra benefits of the system knowing that I was there. There's also one other big thing too that uh, I think is a huge benefit for using GPS even when you know where you're going and that's uh, traffic and weather information. Right, which pops, Real time. Up, pops up automatically with Google Now. Um, right. Just by opening up, uh, by essentially doing a single swipe up when I start up my phone, um, it gives me weather, it gives me navigation cues to places that I'm likely to be going. It pays attention to my calendar, so if, if it knows, because I put in the address bar in my Google Calendar, that I'm going to this place at this particular time, or I'm supposed to be at this place at this particular time, it gives me a warning. It says, if you don't leave right now, you're going to be late. It's amazing. It's That's amazing. really, really great, but it requires that kind of whole system integration. And not only is Apple not doing whole system integration, they're not even doing maps well. Right. And so, I think the important thing is, is like, let's, let's, let's not kid ourselves, okay? Apple is, even with Steve Jobs gone, Apple still is someone that pays very close attention to minutia of their products. And I know, and there's no, they were, there's, this was not a surprise. I refuse to believe that they, they released this maps product and they were like, oh, we had no idea it was so crappy. They knew. They had to have known. And I think what the, the smart move would have been would have either, like with the, the new Passbook app that they have, make it right. an optional download. 
Passbook is the equivalent of Google Now, or I should say Google Now was a response to Passbook. Um, they should have made Apple Maps an optional download at this point in iOS 6 and left the Maps program, which was based on Google Maps, available for their customers as a transitionary thing. I mean, what's the big deal? I mean, Microsoft is doing that now. Microsoft is transitioning their phone maps from Bing Maps to what they're calling Nokia 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 Maps. Yeah, Nokia has done a great job. Yeah, because Nokia owns a major uh, Navtech, which is a major mapping provider for GPS solutions. Uh, yeah. So you know, even though Bing Maps are recognized as probably the second best maps offering to Google Maps that you can get, they're highly accurate, highly respected maps. Microsoft knows that Navtech is even better. And so they're, they're right now, they're, you know, Windows 7 phone, when Nokia said we we're going to make devices for Windows phone, Microsoft, no problem. So they offer the Bing Maps app, and, and for Nokia customers, they have the Nokia app available. So if you're a Nokia phone user, you could have both, both apps on your phone. Windows 8 phone, there's no more Bing Maps. It's going to be all Nokia Maps for everybody, regardless of if it's an HTC, a Nokia, a Samsung, whatever. And I think that's the way... It should have been done. Apple should have taken a similar approach because people then could have rolled back, even though they're not getting real-time navigation from Map, Google Maps. They never got it before. They could still get accurate traveling information Well, did you've come see, to expect over the years. Did you see the apology that was issued by Apple? Absolutely. Tim Cook said, you know, in the meantime, use Bing Maps for right. iOS right. Or, or MapQuest. Or Waze. Right, and which is, I mean, but for me, the, 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 the caveat that I, I love to latch on to about that apology is that the first one he mentioned was Bing Maps. Yeah. And I think, you know, again, I think this is just another wonderful example of an arbitrary decision being made uh, in this, you know, for the sake of forcing the new Apple product rather than really taking a look at how good of a product it is and how that's gonna that that product is gonna affect their customer base. I guarantee you, if Steve Jobs was alive, Apple Maps would have not been released. It certainly was a misstep, and I think they realized that it was a misstep. And I I don't know whether they had to do it. You're you're saying that they did not have to do it. I think that their hand was forced a bit, and maybe they just didn't know how bad it was going to be. That's possible too. But um, you know, either way. Another negative decision, just like their iPod, you know, the, the cable switch, this is affecting their customer base negatively. And, you know, I can't, the only other example I can think of, which is our third topic for this uh, little thing here, that's happened that said screwed customers this badly is uh, the uh, HD DVD standard uh, going away. Now, again, we're not talking HD DVD does not have a customer base like iOS does. I mean, we're talking... The number one uh, selling, uh, you know, phone operating system. Uh, you know, not obviously Android has more activations, but you know, we all know that Apple makes more money on iOS than any other provider uh, that's out there. Out there, and the market share, you know, is huge. Yeah. And HD DVD was a very a niche product. It was, uh, for those of you who don't know, there were two competing high definition media standards. Uh, HD DVD, which was backed by uh, Toshiba and Microsoft, and then Blu-ray, which was backed by Sony and uh, I don't remember the other partner that Sony had with the Blu-ray standard. But there was there was, was competing formats. Say that it, again. It was uh, essentially VHS Beta version two. Exactly right. Yeah. Um, and they existed. They coexisted for you know about two years. You know. W there were reasons that people liked HD DVD. There were reasons people liked Blu-ray. I was personally somebody that liked HD DVD over Blu-ray. And, you know, you were able to pretty much get what, uh, whatever movie you wanted on either platform. It wasn't a problem. Pricing was, was, was pretty fair. Uh, and, you know, but the one thing that sucked for the customer was that you had some movie houses that were only HD DVD and other movie houses that were only Blu-ray. So you were kind of like screwed in a sense sometimes in terms of what you could buy. And 
there was a decision made by Microsoft and Toshiba together to fold the HD DVD platform after two years because of an exclusive deal struck by Paramount to only release films on um, the Blu-ray standard. And so people that have, that have invested in the HD DVD standard, like myself, spent you know, $300 on a player, invested in you know, uh, you know, probably tw I had 20 or tw about 20 t titles at, you know, 20 to $25 a pop, you know, I had a couple thousand dollars sunk into this, uh, and I, it was gone. Like, just like that yeah. overnight over done. And, uh, you know, again, that's the, the only thing that I can even think of in the last 12 years that could even come close to rivaling these decisions that Apple's made. And I almost feel like the decisions Apple made are even worse because, like we talked about, it is impacting millions and millions and millions of customers, whereas HD DVD only impacted uh, a couple hundred thousand people worldwide. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I was lucky in that respect because I, I had essentially decided to move away from physical media around the same time I stopped touching paper on purpose. Which, which was before uh, the HD, DVD, Blu-ray debacle. And, you know, I, every once in a while I'll use a USB key, but generally speaking, unless I am absolutely forced, I don't use external media. I, I, you know, I have hard drives that are external, and, and that's about it. And um, with the advent and presence of great cloud services that are affordable that have gigabytes and gigabytes, you know, how long is it going to be before we just buy two terabytes of cloud storage that is on Dropbox for whatever, $100 a year? And, um, and the question goes away. Uh, you know, once throughput is up to speed and, and we don't have to worry so much about uh, whether there's a trickle issue and whether and when the prices are down so that I can just have all that storage and be able to store the equivalent of a DVD for an install on my cloud storage and have it there forever backed up and not have to worry about it. You know, we, we are approaching that. It's still expensive, it's still slow, and it's still somewhat unreliable, but that's changing. I think that your uh, example that you just gave of your vision of the future, I think, is very optimistic in the sense oh, that... I'm an optimist. I'm, I'm going to disagree in the sense that I think you're absolutely right. Physical media, I totally agree, is dead. It's dying. Uh, in five years, we probably won't be using it the way we do now, absolutely. But I think we're going to change. And instead of you purchasing music and having a copy of it that you can store on online storage, it's going to be licenses. You're, well, going to be given, you're going to be given a license to stream or you know what, or download it, but I you're do, not going to own anything. I do this right now, Sean, and and you do too to some degree. I know that uh, Sean Holland does. It, it, the investment is in something like Spotify. I happen to choose Spotify. I pay to pay ten dollars a month more than I pay for Netflix, and I use Netflix more, but I pay for Spotify because it is still aware of my local media, and if I really want something that's not on on Spotify, I can go and um, acquire that music some other way. But for the most part, uh, my music collecting days are over. You know, all I do is make playlists now. And uh, very often they are playlists that somebody else made of music that is already on Spotify, and it's more music than I can possibly listen to. Right. I tend to listen to the same 14 artists all the time anyway because I'm, I'm stuck in a hole in a K-hole of uh, dubstep, you know? Yeah. Uh, that, I'm okay with that. I, um, if I want to listen to jazz, I have jazz in my personal collection that I collected before this time. But generally speaking, I like to listen to new music now, and Spotify gives me that opportunity. Um, I agree with you. In the same way that a cloud service for storage provides me with the ability to store all of my documents forever, when I take a photo, I don't take a photo with my DSLR anymore. I take it with my phone. So do I. And when I take it with my phone, it automatically goes to Facebook, it automatically goes to Dropbox, and it automatically goes to Picasso. So uh, I have three backups of every photo I take. 
and I have the ability to share from any of those services to any of those other services and elsewhere. Right. It's such a beautiful time that we live in in that respect. Right. As as I'm connected to the internet over 3G or 4G or over Wi-Fi, uh, I'm able to get to all of my music and then some, all of the photos that I've taken in the last year, all of the and then and then some, all of the documents that I've written in the last three years. Uh, I do not really need a hard drive per se anymore, except for things like large photos design, and archives. And I wish I didn't have to worry about that. I wish I could just take my terabyte drive, put it up online, take all the contents of it, put it up there, and have a little tiny footprint of an operating system that I could just access that content with. And I would deal with the two days a year where I can't get online. Or I would prefer 3G or 4G. I wish we had clear in Plainsboro, but we don't. We don't have WiMAX. I, you know, that's another problem. But these things are solvable and reality, and it's not science fiction. When I walk around with my phone, I have access to every piece of media, audio, video, uh, music, document, no matter what, I can get to it from my phone as long as I have an internet connection, and I have an internet connection most of the damn time. And I think that a lot of there's there's some providers out there right now that are already offering this future. Uh, Chrome, Chromebooks. Yeah, I have you know, them right here. Yeah, it's 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 there. It's now. I mean, that's what a Chromebook does. Exactly what you described. You know, there's uh, Microsoft and their partners have just released uh, information about uh, Windows 8 phones and the new Microsoft Surface tablet. Uh, some of those devices don't have expandable storage, and people are like, "What?" They're like freaking out about it. And you know, I'm of the mindset, and a good a good colleague of mine, uh, Shane Smith, is also of the mindset that it's not a big deal. We don't care. You always mention Shane like I never met the guy. Well, I'm mentioning I'm mentioning him for our audience, not for oh, you. Okay. <laughs> and uh, we don't care because of how deeply ingrained Microsoft's cloud services are in Windows Phone and and Windows 8 and and you know their uh, operating system for their tablet as well, Windows RT 8. Right. And uh, you know, it doesn't matter. Like you said, you, you throw it up on SkyDrive. I have access to my photos, my music. It's not a big deal. My documents, everything. And Android has been doing that for years. That was one of the things about Android I always loved uh, and was luckily something I didn't really lose by switching to Windows Phone because SkyDrive was... It's highly you know, portable. You can even get Google Drive on uh, Linux because it's browser-based. Right. And I can even get Google Drive on Windows Phone either. Also, there's other... Uh, apps that have been developed to use those APIs on the Windows Phone platform. So it's you know it's a win-win for everybody. And I and SkyDrive is available on Android too. You know so and Box.net and uh, other solutions for the same Dropbox. Right. I mean we're living that future now. It's just a matter of the mainstream users catching on and using that. My only caveat is the cost. I mean for for Dropbox for example, which I think is is almost best of breed except for Google Docs if you want to do editing in the system. Uh, what I love about Dropbox is that it still addresses the needs of a traditional user in that it's just a folder on your desktop, but it's also a folder on your phone. Um, it's impractical for me to use Dropbox right now on my phone because I don't have enough local storage in order to maintain it. Right. I can get to that content, but I don't, wouldn't want to download all that st stuff automatically to my phone right no problem but uh, Google Drive is perfect it does not download to my phone it only you know hold lets me see a copy of whatever I'm working on allows me to edit which is nice you know I'm, I'm in a meeting we're talking about a document I bring it up I make a change and instantaneously it's there that's a beautiful beautiful thing I don't have to worry about anything but the app or a browser right it um, is a beautiful thing but it doesn't meet the need of high quality video. I mean, if we're talking about HD DVD versus Blu-ray, uh, neither neither one of those qualities is going to make it to my phone anyway. No, absolutely not. It's also not going to make it to my Chromebook. Nope. Mostly because of the bottleneck at the wall. Right. Right. Which absolutely is a different right. problem. Why why we don't all have Google Fiber right now is we're not there yet. We're not there. We're getting there though. We're getting there, and it's it's reality is possible. 
Absolutely. Which is different than, you know, if we talk about time travel, time travel uh, is, is theoretical. This, this is actually a reality we can have. Right. So uh, the next topic, which uh, you mentioned tonight as we were getting ready to go on the air, um, it turns out was something that you wanted to talk about and is a company that I think you're newly uh, engaged with and that you're having a great experience with. And it turned out it was a company that I was a customer of for a very long time. Uh, and about two years ago, I ended my relationship with them uh, amicably. Um, and let's talk about them. And that company is Stamps.com. And uh, I'd love to hear about uh, about your experience. What, what what was it about them that you wanted to talk about tonight? Right. So uh, for those of you who watch our podcast, you probably see me sucking on this thing. And you might say, what an odd, strange thing. And uh, the reason I suck on it is because I'm addicted to nicotine. Uh, but I don't want to die from my addiction to nicotine. And Sean and I, I, I hope I'm not uh, telling tales out of school by saying Sean and I have uh, smoked cigars many times on occasion. We've enjoyed cigars together. Yes. And uh, chances are my time with cigars is not done, that I, I may enjoy a cigar from time to time. In fact, I know it because it's, it's a different experience. But there was a time, a uh, long time ago, when I was addicted to cigarettes, and uh, long after Sean and I had cigars for the first time, I, I was addicted to cigars. I was smoking uh, one to two cigars a day for a while, and Sean may not even know this. Didn't know it. Yeah, cigars are expensive. They are. Uh, so anyway, uh, cigars are also uh, packed with carcinogens because of the nature of cigars, right? And when you're inhaling smoke into your lungs, you're uh, not inhaling smoke in the case of cigars, but when you are bringing that smoke into your body, you are introducing known carcinogens into your body, whether it be your mouth or your lungs or both or your eyes or whatever. And... Um, I didn't like that. It wasn't necessarily having a direct effect on my health that was noticeable because cigars and cigarettes affect your lungs, for example, differently. But it was having an effect on my, um, my health and my long-term health. And I, I was pretty sure that I was on my way to, like, mouth cancer. So anyway, I looked at electronic cigarettes. And the easiest way to get involved with electronic cigarettes, the benefit of which is that the carcinogens go away. The, you still get nicotine, but the carcinogens go away. So uh, there's flavor and there's nicotine in this, so you meet your addiction. But um, there's like 4,000 carcinogens that are present in, in uh, tobacco products, the way that they're packaged. So this was a means to an end to remove the carcinogens from my process of getting nicotine. Nicotine is a poison, by the way, and it's addictive. So I would not suggest that you go and start it. Uh, but this is better than that. And it's a different experience. It's not quite the same. It's more like smoking a hookah than it is smoking a cigar. But it meets my need, and I'm very happy about it. But there is a cost associated with this, just like there's a cost associated with cigars. The cost of a good cigar is between $10 and $25 a, a pop, and that can get really expensive if you're, if you're smoking a cigar a day. I was smoking much cheaper cigars, which really dampens the experience. So anyway, uh, the way, easiest way to get involved with electronic cigarettes is to go to a 7-Eleven where they have a product called Enjoy, which is a um, cartomizer and a battery and the battery is USB based. You, you plug it into a USB charger and you buy refilled cartomizers to uh, screw on and smoke as though it's a cigarette. They call it vaping. They call it vaping. And uh, there is a cult following of, of electronic cigarettes. So these cartomizers, these things, if you buy them in 7 Eleven, in a five pack costs twenty dollars for a five pack and a single uh, cartomizer which is not refillable they specifically stop making them able to be refilled uh, then costs essentially four dollars a, a pop right yeah. and it will not last your whole day if you are a heavy vapor so you end up spending twenty dollars a week in electronic cigarettes, which is no better, it's, it's 
very expensive. So the next step for most people who get involved in this is to move to an, a more sophisticated electronic cigarette that allows for refilling and is actually built for it. And buying uh, electronic cigarette juice, e-juice. And a bottle like this lasts me about a month and costs fifteen dollars. Oh wow! Okay, and the cardamizers last for several days and are about two dollars each. So it's a much better situation, much more affordable, and costs closer to twenty dollars a month, or maybe thirty or forty dollars a month at the at the high end. So anyway, finding a supplier can be difficult because you don't know the quality of this product, you don't know the quality of this product necessarily, and there's not a lot of local suppliers, so it's not as though I can go to the corner store like 7-Eleven and try it. They don't sell this or this at 7-Eleven. So anyway, uh, after doing a lot of research, and there's plenty of forums that talk about electronic cigarettes and replacement juices and uh, electronic cigarette devices, I came across a product called a company called Tasty Vapor that's owned and run by a guy named Jeff Braithwaite. And um, what I found is that the service that I get from this company is so much more than the service I get typically at a 7-Eleven, for example. You know, we always talk about Wawa as best practice. 7-Eleven is not usually best practice. 7-Eleven is usually like back alley. Yeah. I, feel, I feel like I'm going through a drug deal every time I get a cup of coffee there. Um, and sometime I'll have to tell you about my trip to Europe. And when I came back, I, I kissed the ground and then ran for a 7-Eleven because uh, I had missed 7-Eleven like convenience stores so much. And I, why I wasn't running for a while, I'm not exactly sure. But <laughs> anyway, uh, but yeah, so... In the search for electronic cigarettes, there was great reviews for the juice, for the flavors in the juice. And people can make crap juice, or they can make really, really delicious flavors. And uh, Tasty Vapor had a great selection of flavors. Where after I tried them, I realized how tasty they were, that it wasn't false advertising. But the tastiest part of their service is their service itself, the way in which they send you their product. So their website is fine. It allows you to, to make a lot of choices about the juice, like you can get different powers of nicotine uh, by drop-down, and uh, you can choose a lot of different pre-existing flavors, or you can make your own. So I have a flavor that I like pretty often that's a custom flavor that's 3.6% uh, nicotine by volume, and is cherry, lemonade, and bubblegum, which sounds disgusting but is really tasty. And um, so you go through all that process and you say, give me four of these, right? And you click submit, you, you uh, put in your credit card information and you wait. Uh, they're in California. I usually get my product within two days, no matter what it is, whether it's hardware or software or uh, liquid or what. But they use stamps.com. And they have several stages in their workflow, including order accepted, order processed, uh, mixing, because they have to mix these uh, juices themselves in custom batches because nobody else may want lemonade, cherry, bubblegum. Uh, they have to do the specific nicotine power that I want. And so there's a process that they have to go through. Sometimes they have to pull it, if it's hardware, like if they're pulling cardamizers for me, uh, sometimes there's a special order where they say there's going to be a delay. And because stamps.com gives them the ability to predetermine these stages of my order, they, whenever they go in to do any of these things, it sends me an email and says, oh, and by the way, they just started mixing your order. Oh, and by the way, uh, Jeff just went and pulled your cardamizers. Oh, and by the way, so I know exactly, precisely, it's like being at a subway and watching somebody build your sandwich, except it's about electronic cigarettes. And it's such a beautiful thing because, uh, especially given the nature of this product, is that 
there's an addiction involved. If I just ran out of juice and I'm desperate to get my next bottle of juice, I really want to know where it is. And so the fact that they use this uh, stamps.com in order to provide that information to me, it reminds me too of like a student who just took a test and they want to know what their grade is as soon as possible. And they probably want to know whether or not the teacher's grading papers right now. And with something like stamps.com where it gives me up-to-date information about where they are in that process and when I can expect it, meeting my need for knowing what's going on is almost more important than the thing happening. In other words, knowing where they are in the process of, my, of fulfilling my order is a very fulfilling, satisfying thing. And uh, at the end, of course, it gives me uh, the shipping uh, to US, through U.S. Postal Service. And once it passes from stamps.com to the U.S. Postal Service, it gives me a tracking number. And uh, then I follow that system in order to see where it is in the, you know, and they're very good about saying it's in California, it's in Utah, it just showed up in New Jersey, it's going to be at your house, they just dropped it off. You still there, Sean? You I'm here. I thought you were going to finish your point. Well, my whole point is that uh, customer service also extends to making people aware of what the service is. You know, we, we use a ticketing system at Princeton. I'm not sure whether you use that same ticketing system, OPM. I do, yeah. Well, OPM can be used correctly, and it can be used incorrectly, like any system. Right. You know, you can use fire to cook your dinner, or you can use fire to burn down your house. And uh, <laughs> so the idea that uh, if you go into a, any ticketing system and are gratuitous with your information about where you are in the process of giving somebody support and what you just found out about the problem and whether or not it's a solvable problem and when they can expect to get a call from you and when a visit's going to happen and it's communication. C great communication is great customer service. So that's my experience with stamps.com, and if ever I end up in a situation where I am creating products it's and, 11 and sending them, thank you, Dr. Hawking, and sending them out to people, uh, I will certainly use stamps.com because it, it just provides me as a vendor and the customer a great communication interface that does not involve a lot of... Um, back and forth, you know, all he probably has to do, Jeff at Tasty Vapor, all he probably has to do, and maybe you can give me some insight into this from when you were a vendor, I'm supposing, uh, is click a button saying, now I'm mixing this order, or click a button saying, now uh, we're pulling items. Uh, I was, yes, I in fact was a vendor uh, for stamps.com. Uh, I know I've mentioned it a couple times, uh, I'm a very, very big video game player, big time have been since uh, the age of two. And um, uh, I realized, I'm trying to think when, I guess it would have been sometime in 2004, 2005, that there is a big online market for used video games. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm somebody that, you know, doesn't necessarily want to hold on to every game I've ever owned. You know, I know that there is a market, there's an opportunity to get money for my used games. I used to rely on uh, places like Funko Land and GameStop who would give you store credit. Uh, I did that because I worked for those institutions. But at the same time, I knew that there was a, you know, they ripped their customers off big time, huge, big time. You know, they'll give you $8 for something and then go turn around and sell it for 40 So that's it's completely absurd. Where, uh, and then I discovered Half.com, which people most might pretty much know uh, as a textbook service. Uh, you know, I had been using Half.com to buy used uh, music, um, used DVDs, and even some uh, CDs as well. Is Half.com still around? Absolutely it is. People, people ask that question to me all the time. Uh, and I made a decision early on after looking at eBay, Amazon, and a bunch of other platforms that allow you to sell uh, different forms of media uh, secondhand that Half.com was the platform I wanted to go with. And so I ran this business for, you know, I started the business off and it was kind of a, 
you know, I wanted to increase the amount of product that I offered at a given time. And it was difficult for me because I would have to go to a post office because they wanted you to send your product via media mail. And media mail was not, you know, you, the only way you could get media mail was to go to the post office with your package and ship it out. And there really is no place I hate more spending my time than in line at a post office. And many people agree with you, I think. Yeah, it's terrible. And so I did research. I said, listen, if I'm going to, if I'm going to, if I'm going to increase my volume of product, I need to be able to go online and do this. And I found out that the United States Postal Service offered online postage purchasing and, and, sh and package shipping, but they did not offer media mail shipping, which was a huge, huge problem for me. So I discovered that stamps.com offered media mail. They were the only online reseller of postage that offered media mail option. So I signed up with them. They gave me tons of freebies to signing up. I got, you know, free, free postage. I got a free digital scale to weigh my packages, all kinds of nonsense. And I was a customer of theirs for about, uh, you know, five years. I got, or not six years because I canceled my subscription with them in 2011. And, you know, I increased my volume of product. You know, I would, I would go to a store sometimes. I'd see a game at a ridiculously cheap price. I'd clean, I'd clean them out. I'd buy 30 copies of a game. One time I went to a, when Comp USA was closing in Lawrenceville, they had uh, 50 copies of a game called City of Villains. It was a collector's edition, uh, and they were selling all 50 copies for 50 cents. Wow. Bought them all. Bought them all. And I, I sat up. I, I was selling copies of City of Villains on Half.com for a year because I had that many. And, you know, Stamps.com made it easy. Order would come in from Half.com. I'd log into Stamps.com, paste the address information in. Uh, I could put the, the customer's email address in and, you know, fire off that label. And it would email them to let them know the tracking number when it was shipped. And then it would automatically update them on the on where the, the product was. And if you look at my rating, you know, half.com is tied into eBay. I have a hundred percent rating. Yeah. I've been an eBay user since two, uh, since 1999 and I have a hundred percent rating. I don't know anybody that can really say that. Um, I have, you know, a couple, I have, uh, you know, almost 400, uh, positive pieces of feedback at this point. And most of that's because of stamps.com. You know, they communicated with my customers in a way that they weren't used to. They loved the amount of information. Uh, you know, I charged fair shipping prices because stamps.com actually gave you a little bit of a discount than going to the post office. It was awesome. And Shane, did you know that stamps.com actually offers, uh, they're a major sponsor of uh, some podcasts? Yeah, Nerdist. I, 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 I just started recent listening to Nerdist recently, and they're a huge advertiser on there. They advertise on the Twit Network, too. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, so I mean, I'm familiar with it from them too, and you know that they, they have some good deals. But uh, it's just interesting because I, it's funny as we talk about this, we ought to probably approach them and see if they want to advertise. Absolutely, we should. So you know, I used them for years, and and it was beautiful for me because you know uh, when I worked at Ryder, I could bring my product in with the labels on it, drop it off in the mailbox or take it over to mailing services on campus, which was not a, wasn't difficult to do. Yeah. And I would ship out, you know, 10 to 20 pieces of product, you know, at a time, no problem. Um, because shipping from uh, my rental properties that I lived in was not easy, you know, because we had a mailbox and such. Right. So I eventually canceled my subscription when I moved into my house uh, for two reasons. One was that half.com changed, uh, the United States Postal Service changed it's policy on media mail. Uh, video games were no longer considered eligible for media mail. And Half.com knew that change was coming, so they forced everybody to use uh, first-class mail. And when that happened, I, I just didn't need to pay $15 a month to subscribe to Stamps.com. I could just go to the Postal Service website, print out my label for free without a, you know, without a subscription and get the same cost and the same level of service. Uh, so when I called him up, I was like, listen, you know, I'm a, I've am been a vendor. I, I've had to use media mail. I don't have to anymore. So are you really not giving me an advantage? They were great. You know, they, they let me cancel. No problem. They even, they said that there was a free package that where I wouldn't have to pay a monthly 
service uh, if I wanted to, and I just said, you know, it's okay. You know, I I got six years out of you guys. You were wonderful, uh, and I just want to just let it go. And just a couple weeks ago, I didn't even realize this. I had credit left over in my account. Again, like I said, I closed my account in 2011. About two weeks ago, I got a check in the mail from stamps.com with that remaining credit. Oh, wow. So I'm a huge, I'm a, I think they're a good company. I think they do things great. I think they run the, uh, they are head over heels better than the postal services online uh, portal. They offer such better service, such better products, because you can even ship FedEx and UPS from stamps.com. It's unbelievable. And they make international mailing very easy, you know, because they do the customs forms right in there. It's integrated. Wonderful, wonderful logistics system. Strongly recommend it for anybody who is a vendor who needs to ship products. It's definitely worth the $15 a month to be a stamps.com subscriber. Yeah, and it sounds like it's in keeping with our with our model of you know what's what's the best method of customer service in in whatever way that you can serve. If you are shipping to somebody, letting them know what's going on, uh, stamps.com makes it easy and therefore provides better customer service. Absolutely. Uh, how are we doing time wise? I think we've uh, probably hit our hour, right? Yeah, I think we have. Okay. Well, I guess that means our third topic again for the second week in a row which is end-to-end -end service support organizations will be bumped again to next week. We'll get to it one of these days. We will. It's, it's good to have future topics because Absolutely. our audience is saturated. Yes. So uh, we now have uh, a presence on Facebook. Look us up on uh, Facebook, the customer and the service. Just type it right into the search box there on Facebook. Um, like us. Give us a like. We'll keep you up to date on what we're doing. Uh, we have a vibrant community that's growing there. Uh, just another place for you to talk to other fans of the show, see what we're doing. Suggest uh, ideas for topics? Absolutely, yeah. It's a, it's a great – the reason we started it, we wanted to, as we talked about last week, wanted a way for our, our listeners to be able to communicate directly with us about the show, what they think of the show, ideas. And, uh, you know, we're really looking forward to hearing from everybody uh, about how we're doing and uh, about things that you guys want us to talk about. Absolutely. So, John, it was a pleasure as always. As always, Sean. Looking forward to next week. Me too. Good. And uh, I'll see you then. Thanks so much. No problem. Thank you. Bye. Good night.